Um, so the, with this talk, we hope that uh, you can get a good understanding of how the contribution workflow uh, works uh, on the Diego team and as well as uh, other Cloud Foundry projects and uh, how does the engineering team engage with the community to uh, deal with issues and um, take pull requests and that kind of thing. Uh, we also hope that you get encouraged to get involved and, and start contributing to either Diego or any other Cloud Foundry project if you are not doing that already. Um, and we'll do that by giving you a general overview of how that process works with some background. Um, and we'll show a walkthrough of how a simple contribution uh, makes its way through um, an issue, uh, and then becoming a pull request, and then finally uh, getting merged into Diego. Um, and lastly, we'll give you just some quick tips about how to um, go about sending a uh, contribution and getting that accepted and preventing it from getting rejected, basically. Um, so some background, uh, pull request, if you're not familiar, is a term on GitHub that signifies a request to merge a uh, merge changes onto a project. Uh, so that's a great way to collaborate because it allows to, it's basically a conversation started and it has, um, uh, you can comment and have multiple people uh, basically review the same uh, change set uh, together. Uh, and um, Diego is uh, first and foremost a, a team on Cloud Foundry um, that's part of the, the bigger Cloud Foundry project. And uh, it's a team that maintains the Diego project, uh, which is the container scheduler and orchestrator within Cloud Foundry. The full description of Diego is kind of outside the scope of this talk, uh, but the team is composed of uh, four and a half bears, like we like to, to say, uh, which means the nine engineers, and then one product manager. Uh, one product manager. And these uh, engineers are from a variety of companies. So like I said, I'm from Pivotal. Uh, Jen here is from HPE. Uh, we have a few engineers from IBM on the team, and we've had uh, uh, folks from SAP, GE, and other companies before on the team as well. Um, so it's uh, very uh, diverse in that way. Uh, those developers work full-time on the project and uh, are responsible for not only uh, putting the project forward and developing the features that the project uh, has to, to work on, but also engaging with the community and um, dealing with issues and, and PRs. Uh, the team rotates fairly frequently. Like I said, I was on the Diego team. I'm no longer on the team. Um, so we rotate uh, within Cloud Foundry uh, every every few months uh, and sometimes a little longer than that. Uh, but yeah. Um, so to, to get involved and to get in contact with the team, uh, we have um, a few things you can do. You can open a GitHub issue if you already have a bug report uh, and you know the steps to reproduce it, or you just have some suggestion that is a little more um, consolidated and you, you, you just want to propose that just a specific uh, project of Diego or, or of Cloud Foundry. Uh, or if you just want to have a, a conversation or you have a question uh, about how to, how to get started, uh, you can join us on our Slack channel uh, on the cloudfoundry.slack.com. Um, each day we have a designed interrupt pair. Um, what that means is in the morning we'll assign one of the pairs uh, to be responsible for looking in Slack. So on the top of our Slack channel on the subject line, there will be a couple of names listed. Uh, the, those are the people responsible for uh, answering to the community on Slack. So you can come by and, and, and ask any question you might have. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, if you have some longer conversation that needs more eyes, maybe it's not with only one team, one larger, uh, larger Cloud Foundry discussion, you can use the CF dev mailing list as well uh, to get started with that communication. Um, so let's get to the walkthrough. Um, so Jen will play a developer that's not on the on the core team of Diego. So she does not have commit rights, and she noticed an opportunity to improve one of the code bases, and she wants to contribute with that change. And I will play a developer on the core team that will assist her with that contribution, uh, and I will be responsible for community for the day. So the same way we have an interrupt pair, uh, we also assign one pair to deal with community, and th what that means is we will look at issues and pull requests and uh, interactions from the community um, for the beginning of the day to just um, be responsive to the community and, and make sure that those contributions are making their way through efficiently. 
Um, so like, like Luan said, I'm an um, outside contributor. I'm poking around a little bit at Diego. I'm trying to understand the code a little bit better. Um, I'm taking a look at, in this case, the executor code base. We have lots of separate code bases inside Diego, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but I'm poking around, I'm taking a look, trying to get a little bit involved, and I notice there's one opportunity um, for a bit of a refactor. Um, and so before I want to dive in and actually start working on it and submit the pull requests and stuff, I want to first just verify with the team that they agree that this is an appropriate refactor. Um, this can save you a lot of time, um, because if you go through and run all the tests, do all the work to make the PR and then submit the PR, and then later it turns out like the Diego team doesn't really agree with the direction or it conflicts with other work in progress or something, that's a lot of wasted effort on your part, um, and it's just a lot of frustration for everyone involved. Um, so in this case, I take a look, I notice an opportunity for improvement, I create an issue and I say like, hey, I noticed this, um, is it okay if I actually go ahead and fix it? All right, so Jen then sends the issue and I, as the uh, pair responsible for that uh, community interaction on that day, will notice that um, a story will get created. So we have a, we have a thing called Gitbot that will um, look at our Git repos and create uh, stories on our pivotal tracker so that uh, we have more visibility into uh, the state of that and what's going on there. So a story will get created in the community backlog and then we'll all look at it and uh, and respond uh, as quickly as possible. So in this case, I'm just telling Jan that I, um, I agree with the change and I'm just giving her the thumbs up to go ahead and do it. So just a quick note about how our repos are structured in Diego. We have one repo called Diego Release. This is kind of the parent repository of all of our other microservices. This serves as our Bosch release. It's also a Go path, um, and it's sort of the parent of all of our other microservices. Each one of our other subcomponents is all a submodule inside of the Diego Release repo. Um, so all of our Go code is generally in one of these submodules. So most of the time, you're not going to be submitting, submitting pull requests to Diego Release directly. You're going to be submitting a pull request to one of these submodules. Um, and then later, once the pull request gets accepted, someone from the Diego team will go ahead and make a commit to Diego Release to bump the submodule, meaning update the SHA um, of that submodule to match what you just submitted. Um, so in general, you're not going to be needing to uh, make PRs to Diego release unless you're doing something related to the Bosch release itself. So that means if you're changing the way the manifests are generated or the way the jobs are deployed, then there's going to be stuff in Diego release. But if you're changing Go code, that's not going to be in Diego release itself. Um, so uh, we're going to be playing some videos um, as these go, but the details of what we're running here, like you don't have to jot down exactly what's being run here. Um, uh, all the instructions here are in this document right here. This is the contribution document um, where we list out the exact steps you need to do to set up your environment and stuff like that. So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to set up my environment. I got the okay from Lu Luan to go ahead and make this fix, but I have a brand new MacBook. I've never worked on Diego before. Um, I need to actually go and um, set up Bosch Lite and configure my environment so I can work on Diego. Um, so the very first thing we're going to do is set up Bosch Lite. Um, some of you might be familiar with Bosch. It's like the orchestration tool that we use in Cloud Foundry. Bosch lets us deploy to multiple different IaaS's, so you can deploy to AWS and um, Google Cloud and all these things. You can also deploy to a local VM called Bosch Lite, um, and that's what we do for all of our testing. So we have a real live Cloud Foundry and a real Diego. It's just running within individual containers in a VM on your local machine. Um, so we use this for running our basic acceptance tests and, um, and stuff like that. Um, so here, I'm just, we're just cloning the Bosch Lite repository and running Vagrant up to get our local Bosch Lite up and running. Um, next thing we do is we need to actually pull down CF release. So Diego release depends on Cloud Foundry. CF release is a repo that's pretty similar to Diego release in that it's made up of lots of submodules. So CF release has even more submodules than we do, so there's a lot to bring down. Um, so when you bring it down, there's going to be like a... Um, uh, a script in there called scripts update you can run. This basically just does a git pull and updates all the submodules and initiali initializes all the submodules. Um, once you actually have the CF code, um, then we're going to actually do a Bosch create release and a Bosch upload release to get that um, code all set up on the Bosch light box itself. Um, so you can see here we've sped up a bit the um, process. This actually doesn't take quite so fast. Um, 
you'll, you'll find that out when you try to do it yourself. But it should be pretty simple to do. Um, it just can take a little bit. I'm just going to skip the rest of it for now. Um, so the next step is to actually get Diego release. So like I said, Diego depends on CF being there as well, but we also obviously need the Diego release code as well. So now we're going to pull down Diego release. We're going to do the same thing where we're going to clone it and pull down all the submodules, do a Bosch create release and a Bosch upload release. Um, again, all these instructions are laid out in the contributing documentation. Um, Next step is to actually deploy the releases that we just uploaded to Bosch Lite. So what we've just done is we have now some tarballs that contain the source code for CF release and the source code for Diego release, but nothing's actually been deployed to our Bosch Lite yet. They're just tarballs that are sitting waiting for, for us to use them on our Bosch Lite. So now we're going to generate the manifest. Um, that's the deployment manifest for CF release. That's the thing that describes how this Cloud Foundry is supposed to be configured and what properties it has, what uh, VM sizes it needs, and stuff like that. And the CF release repo and the Diego release repo both have um, scripts you can use to generate a, a Bosch manifest that's specific for Bosch Lite, so you don't need to tweak anything yourself. It's already configured to be sized correctly and have the right properties for Bosch Lite. So we run the scripts, generate Bosch Lite dev manifest, and then we actually do a Bosch deploy and we get CF running on our Bosch Lite. And then we're going to do the same thing with Diego. Um, Diego actually requires not only CF release and Diego release, um, but it also requires um, a, either Garden Linux release or Garden Run C. Those are the two um, options that we have right now for running uh, for the actual container uh, runtime. Um, and there's like rootfs release and either etcd release or SQL release. There are a bunch of different components that all come together when you deploy Diego. Um, and in one of the previous steps, we also had to download and um, those tarballs and then put those onto our Bosch Lite as well. Okay, so our Bosch Lite is all up and running. Um, we can also verify that. We, don't, we didn't do it in this case, but we could verify that the Bosch Lite is working correctly by just doing a simple CF push and making sure that it's actually using Diego and just do some basic verification. Um, we also have a big suite of unit tests. So what we're doing right now is we're just, before I even start coding, I want to make sure that my environment is clean and that everything is working right. So I'm running our unit tests right now. Our unit tests run directly on your host machine, on your development machine. So in this case, it's a Mac, and so it's actually running directly on my Mac. Usually the unit tests are pretty well isolated, um, and they're, they run pretty quickly. Um, we also have another um, test, uh, test suite called Anigo. Anigo runs um, a bit more integration type tests. These test that when we have multiple of our microservices all deployed and running together that they can talk to each other. It's not a full Bosch deployment, so it's not really a real Diego or a real CF. It's just testing that um, if we have like this component running and this component running, they should be able to still talk to each other even if it's not deployed on Bosch and we do some basic verification there. We run these um, in a container on uh, Concourse. Some of you may be familiar with Concourse as a CI, continuous integration tool. Um, we use Concourse in this case um, as just a convenient way to run a containerized job locally. We can run it either locally or we can run it on our actual development, uh, our like group um, CI pipeline. So if I don't want to wait for it to run on my machine, um, I can run it on, like in our case, we can run it on our AWS deployed Concourse. But for an outside contributor, you're going to have a local Concourse, most likely, that you're going to run this against. Um, and the steps for setting up Concourse are, again, in that documentation with everything else. Um, it's also a Vagrant box, so you just you bring down Concourse Lite and do Vagrant up, and then you have a locally running Concourse, and you can run these tests. Um, now onto our third um, suite of tests that are run on your local environment. These are the exceptions tests, also called CATs. Um, these are what we need Bosch Lite for. So these are going to be actually verifying CF is working correctly from sort of an end user perspective. These tests actually use the CF CLI directly and make sure that the basic scenarios um, are all working end to end. Um, so this is why we needed to deploy Bosch Lite in the first place. Um, 
And so again, we want to make sure that everything is working with these acceptance tests locally before I actually start doing development. Because if I start doing development and then things are broken, then I'm like, I don't know if I messed it up or if it was messed up to begin with. So we just want to make sure I have a good, clean environment, especially the first time I start doing development for Diego. So now my repo, my uh, local environment seems fine. All the tests pass. Everything seems good. So I'm ready to fork the repository. So in GitHub, um, some of you might be familiar with this already, but when you fork something, it means you're making a copy of it under your local username. So this is going to create a copy of the executor. The executor is one of our sub-modules. Um, it's going to create a copy of the executor, and it's going to put it under the gen spinny user. So it's going to be just like the repo that exists in Cloud Foundry, but it's going to be under my name. Um, now that I have, um, now that I check that out and I do a git pull from my, um, from my version of the repo, um, I'm going to first start off by running a test. I'm going to see that it's a failing test um, to make sure that I'm actually writing a, a test that is actually testing what I want to implement and I'm not just accidentally, after the fact, writing a trivially passing test. Um, and then I'm going to actually code up the fix. And then once I'm satisfied that my code makes the test I wrote pass, I'm going to run all those tests again. So those three test suites that I just showed you, the unit tests, an ego, and the acceptance tests, I'm going to run all those, make sure everything is green. And once that's all done, then I'm ready to start uh, to open the actual PR. So when I go and I do a push to my branch on my uh, forked repo, so gen spinny slash executor, um, when I push to a branch there and I go to GitHub, I'm going to see this little thing pop up that says, do you want to do a compare and pull request? And so I click on that. Um, and then there's an uh, opportunity for me to write a little bit of a description. Here I'm going to reference the issue that I made at the beginning. Um, so I'm going to just say, like, as I said in this issue, um, I want to do this little refactor. That makes it so everything's kind of linked together. And if it's not Luan the next day, if it's some other person from the Diego team, they can follow the track of work and they can go back to the issue and say, ah, OK, they had this discussion. And um, it just keeps everything well linked. Um, so there's some things to keep in mind when you're sending a pull request, um, specifically about testing. Um, we want to we we want to make sure that we are covering edge cases and error cases. So uh, when you're when you're writing your your test cases, add your happy path, but also think about what could go wrong in there. And uh, if if that's not present, we'll likely uh, send send a PR back and say, hey, can you please uh, add a little more test coverage around these uh, scenarios. Uh, so, can just be proactive about that. That helps a lot. The team uh, make sure uh, we're getting a good contribution, and also make sure you run all the tests before you submit the pull request. Jen said that we're probably going to say that again before the end of the talk, but um, it's also very important that the test pass because if the tests are read when we get the pull request, we'll likely not merge it. Um, that said. Um, I'm again the community pair, and I noticed that uh, Jen has uh, sent her pull request like she had promised. Um, so I look at uh, the first thing we, we generally do is through the GitHub UI itself, we'll look at the, the files cha file changes um, just to have a quick glance at what was changed. If there's any like obvious things we can uh, we can recommend to be fixed. Uh, in this case, um, the pull request Jen sent had one uh, styled reference that. Um, the Diego team does uh, that uh, she didn't necessarily follow. Uh, the particular example here is uh, the order of the arguments is not um, what we what we generally do because we generally have a logger as the first argument just to have a standard since that's kind of on all the methods we call. So I just send that feedback to her and instead of just fixing that, I send the feedback so that next time that she sends a contribution, she'll know and not make the same mistake again. Um, and then uh, after I give some feedback on, on the lines, I send uh, one message saying, hey, I, I wrote some feedback to your change. Um, it looks good otherwise. It's good to merge. Just if you could just fix that uh, and send, uh, update the PR, then we can just merge that in. Uh, um, so I see his comment. Um, it's an easy enough, enough fix to do. I just reorder the arguments in that function. Um, after I do that, I'm going to do a git rebase. Um, I'm going to do this so that I can squash my two commits, because I don't want to submit this as two separate commits, um, but also because I want to see if um, there are other changes that have gone in since I did this. I want to rebase against 
origin master, like against the Cloud Foundry version of the executor, um, in case, you know, while we had this back and forth, there might have been a couple of days that went, went by and maybe someone else committed. Um, and so I want to make sure that I'm rebased um, on top of the latest version of origin master um, so that my PR can go in cleanly. Um, then once that's all done and rebased and I have a single commit, I'm going to do a force push to my branch, um, and this is going to automatically update the PR. Um, once I do the force push, I'm going to go back to GitHub and I'm going to update the PR and say, um, hey guys, I updated it with your feedback. Can you take a look again? Well, and then finally, when I get the updated pull request, I will look at it again, just make sure that the changes make sense. And if they do, we'll pull the, uh, we'll pull the code down locally uh, so that we can run the tests. Uh, if there is any like last minute things that we notice, like a typo, for example, in this case, uh, I, I mentioned there that there was a small typo, so I just fixed that. So we'll, we'll do like small fixes like this one um, in the last minute. But we'll run a test, make sure it's all good, and then we'll merge it. Uh, when we push the merge, uh, GitHub will automatically update the story, uh, uh, the, the, the pull request, so Jen gets a notification. It will also update our tracker story, uh, just signify that this is all merged and good to go uh, so that our, our product manager knows and to, to, to take a look at it and, and um, accept the story. Um, yeah, and then that's at that point, uh, the contribution is merged and it's all, all done. Um, so we just want to cover some common rejection reasons, or not, not really rejection, but reasons that we might come back to you and say, oh, we're not ready to merge this yet. Um, so if you don't have adequate test coverage, so remember we want happy path tests, but also edge cases, um, and depending on the scope of the work, that might mean unit tests, or that might mean an ego test or acceptance tests. We'll probably like be working with you through that, like if it's a big enough feature that you might need one of those, we'll point it out to you. Um, but in general, you want to be thinking like, am I having you know, am I testing every edge case? Am I, um, is my code fully tested? Um, another reason we might come back to you or just flat out say we're not taking the pull request is if it conflicts with work that is already in progress. This is more if you don't talk to us before you do it, if you just submit the PR. Um, so if it's conflicting with our roadmap, meaning someone else is already working on something similar, or it's just something that we don't think is the right direction for how we envision the code going. Um, so just a reminder to talk to us first. Um, another reason we could come back to you and say we're not ready to merge it is if the code is not um, rebased against uh, master, meaning it won't merge cleanly. Um, so this is a little bit unfortunate um, that sometimes pull requests can take a couple days to go through because there's a little bit of back and forth. Um, and in that time, you know, if it's taking a while, um, other people come in and actually make commits on, you know, um, in the middle, and so you have to go back and rebase and um, make sure your branch merges in cleanly. Um, another reason is untidy commits. So if there's been a bunch of um, back and forth and a lot of iterations, you know, you might have commits stacking up. Um, in general, for most cases, you probably want to have just a single commit, so you want to squash your commits um, so it looks clean in the Git uh, history once we actually merge it. Um, the other um, issue would be not running the tests, and so you have some failing tests, um, and then we catch that and we come back to you and it lengthens the whole process. Um, so lastly, um, if you want to get involved, but you don't have like a specific feature you're t like dying to do, or you don't find a bug or something like that, um, like you're welcome to come to our Slack channel and say like, hey, you know, my name is blah blah blah. I'm like interested to get uh, my feet wet with Diego, but I don't know where to start. Do you guys have um, some? bug I could work on? Um, is there something I could do? And we'll, wa we'll work with you. We'll try to find something. Um, our tracker is public, so you can look at what we're working on right now. But um, I wouldn't go and just pull something off of tracker and assume that you can work on it. Um, for the most part, we assume that the tracker, the stuff in tracker is stuff that we're going to get to. If you see something in tracker you want to work on, you can message us and say, like, oh, I really want to do this, and then we can talk about that. Um, but in general, like the tracker, we assume that people, the core committers are going to be pulling things off the tracker backlog. So just the, the main point is just talk to us um, if you don't know what you want to work on, or even if you do know what you want to work on, we recommend, recommend talking to us first, and then we can have a conversation before you invest a bunch of work um, and energy. So with all that, is there any questions? Sorry, the question was about license, like contribution license. Like, uh, 
That's a great question. I don't know if we have some automated software or anything that goes through and checks for it. So the question was about. Um, So to send a contribution, you have to sign a CLA. Uh, that's actually an automated process, but that's for the individuals. It doesn't necessarily solve the problem of uh, someone sending contribution that is uh, copied from somewhere else. Uh, yeah, but um, we have a we have an automated process for signing CLAs, um, um, which that that that's basically how we have automated. Yeah, so it, it's tricky. Um, you know, it's tricky. But yeah, that is a there is a point that we didn't mention here, which is that if you try to submit a PR and you haven't signed the CLA, w there's an automated bot that's going to come back and say, um, you know, you need to go and sign the CLA. But it doesn't really solve the problem of people going and like stealing code from places they shouldn't be stealing it. And, yeah. yeah, people don't think about it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of a problem for any open source project. Is you know, you kind of are trusting the people that are. Um, bring the code in to be doing it like uh, an appropriate way. Any more questions? That's a good question. And you should stay for her talk after this. <laughs> <laughs> because the Diego team actually has three time zones now. Yeah. Um, so Generally available from what uh, it's nine on U.S. East Coast until six on West Coast, or yeah, yeah. Um, so there is a good twelve hours there, um, but yeah, it's there. There is some availability uh, issue there. Any more questions? Uh, thank you, everyone.